So, hi everybody. Can you hear me okay? It's Mark's first lecture. It is. He's been with us for a few days, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's my, my honor and privilege to introduce my, my experimental colleague from, from the University of Wisconsin. Um, I tried to say funny things about Mark, but Mark is not a funny Not a funny, guy. no, not so at all. Uh, <laughs> so Very I'll serious. Just, I'll just go back to my seat. He's an outstanding experimentalist, uh, very involved in, in not getting involved with theory and yet <laughs> not managing to avoid that. So I look forward to seeing how he's going to square that circle this time around. Well, thank you, Patrick. Uh, and thanks to all the organizers for the opportunity uh, to be here at this very interesting school. Um, so this is what I'm going to try and cover in these lectures. So I am an experimentalist and I'm going to give you uh, my own personal perspective on uh, important experimental aspects of supercooled liquids and glasses. Um, I was assigned the topic of atomic systems, um, but really I'm going to talk about molecular systems, just a little bit about uh, atomic systems. Um, so in thinking about how to construct these topics, um, I, I'm trained as a chemist, but I've sort of, I've been trying to teach myself to think about things as a material scientist. And so when a material scientist thinks about uh, a class of materials, these first five topics are the topics that come up. At least that's what I see by looking at textbooks. Dynamics in the materials, the thermodynamics, uh, the structure, whatever the properties are of these systems. And then if there are transitions from one kind of material to another, what are the transformation kinetics for those transitions? And so I've tried to organize my thinking uh, using these uh, topics. Uh, the very last topic, will, which will be roughly the third lecture, um, will really focus on um, a particular kind of glass, a vapor deposited glass, I'll tell you some things about these very interesting materials, but what I'm going to do is try and make four or five or six important connections back to the topics that I raised in uh, the first two lectures. So since I think about glasses as materials, um, I, I do want to take just a minute to remind you about some of the important uses of glasses in technology. So polymer glasses and glassy composites, you know, I don't know something like a fifty billion dollar industry. Okay, um, you know, the Boeing, Boeing 787 is a polymer composite, the fuselage. Okay. So when you're flying on those aircraft, you're relying on what we know about glasses as materials. <laughs> I, I see a collective shudder go through the room. <laughs> so the backbone of modern communications is optical fibers, which are silicate glasses. Okay, and these are, are really remarkable materials. They can send a signal uh, 100 kilometers without amplification. Okay, think about how low the scattering cross-section has to do, be for that to be true. You could never do that with a crystal. This is, comes from the homogeneity of glassy materials. Um, OLEDs, that's an optical light emitting diode. If you have a smartphone, that's not an Apple product. Your display is almost certainly an OLED display and the active elements are vapor deposited organic glasses. Okay? These are the things that are uh, conducting electrons and holes and allowing recombination on a dye molecule that makes the color that you see um, in your display. Um, and this will come up again in uh, lecture three. Okay, so I'm going to try and make some connections with the lectures of, that have come previously, probably most closely with uh, 
things that Ludovic and Gilles have said. Um, the idea is the first lecture is quite general. Maybe you'll already know all of this, at least some of you will, but um, hopefully there'll be some interesting tidbits in there, even if you're uh, an expert. And um, I want to encourage you to ask questions um, as they come up. Okay, so I'm going to use a slightly different approach than other lectures. I have to use slides because I want to show you real experimental data, okay? And I don't want you to rely on my sketch. I want you to be able to see what's really there. Okay, so do we have the lights adjusted optimally? Yeah, you have a question already. Excellent. These are all, well, this is a, is a polymer. It's an organic molecule. This is organic molecules. These are silicate glasses. Yeah, metallic glasses um, are important. Actually, the, my understanding, eh, I should be careful about my initials here. We'll write out metallic glass. Mm -hmm. My understanding that the major commercial success for metallic glasses is the core of transformers for uh, electrical transformers. They're, you know, 2% more uh, efficient than uh, a polycrystalline metallic core, which is a big deal when you're working with the whole power grid. So basically every transformer has a, a metallic glass at its core. So yes, there are, I, I wasn't meaning this list to be exhaustive. I was just, you know, offering a few examples. Okay, so um, hopefully... So there won't be four panels on every slide, okay? And there's not going to be 100 slides, okay? But um, hopefully you can see um, the important features here. So what I've shown on this first slide is um, just some data to illustrate, I guess I should write things down, the dramatic slowdown in dynamics as the temperature is lowered towards TG. And um, I had fun picking these examples. Of course, there's hundreds of examples I could pick. But I wanted to pick examples that covered a range of different materials. Okay? So this is an organic polymer, polyvinyl acetate. Um, these two are low molecular weight organic molecules, trisnaphthalbenzene and xylitol. Uh, if you want to, if you know some organic chemistry, this is a five carbon chain in which every carbon has an OH group on it. So it's an extensively hydrogen bonded system. And this is a metallic glass. And so you can see vitriloy is a, is a commercial product. Um, and you can see the composition indicated. It's a five component metallic glass. Um, and it's important that those five components are there and that they're there uh, in those proportions. Okay, so to the slowdown part. So this data shows slowdown uh, a, with temperature uh, a minimum of nine orders of magnitude and up to 19 orders of magnitude. Okay, so xylitol here. This is a dielectric relaxation spectrum. Okay, so to a first approximation, what you're measuring here is the time scale for dipoles to reorient. So if you look at this peak here at 400 Kelvin, reorientation on the time scale of 10 to the 10 hertz. Uh, cool it down to 260, and we're down to 10 to the 1 hertz. Okay, so the shift of that peak nine orders of magnitude um, is the slowdown that occurs across that temperature range. Um, and these are just beautiful experiments. This is from Loidel's group. And the cool thing is that at any given temperature, they have the option of at least 13 orders of magnitude in terms of frequency that they can cover. Um, so this is also dielectric relaxation. Uh, another one of my favorite examples, uh, this is from Ranko Richard. Um, the highest temperature is 10 to the minus 8 seconds. The lowest temperature, oh, 10 to the, yeah, 10 to the minus 8 seconds. The, I got it wrong, the highest temperature, <laughs> 10 to the minus 8 seconds. 
the lowest temperature is 10 to the plus 8 seconds. Okay, so 10 to the plus 8 seconds is a year. Okay, so they actually did an experiment for a year. They got a material to equilibrium. They did an experiment over a year to get that very last point on the graph. Okay, and uh, so here we have, uh, you know, a factor 1.5 in temperature and 16 orders of magnitude. Um, Trisnaphthal benzene, these are viscosity measurements. So viscosity is basically a measure of the time it takes a material to flow. The, um, you use different experimental methods in the different uh, regimes. Uh, maybe you've seen a capillary viscometer, which is basically just a tube, and you let a liquid flow through it. You time it. You can get the viscosity from that. In the low temperature end, you have to use much more sophisticated techniques because the material wouldn't would never flow on a reasonable time scale in a capillary viscometer. Um, so here we start off with trisnaphthal benzene at 10 to the minus 2 poise. That's um, uh, the same viscosity as water, okay, centipoise. And then by the time we've cooled the temperature down, in this case by a factor of 2, uh, you see the glass transition here, and there's a sharp kink in the temperature dependence, and we roll over to a different temperature dependence, and uh, we top out with an estimated viscosity of the glass at 10 to the 17th poise, uh, which is a, just a staggeringly huge number. Um, okay, so the final example is a metallic glass, and... Uh, Again, so what's plotted here uh, is actually, it's a mechanical experiment. You um, deform the sample a small amount suddenly, and you measure how long it takes the force to decay with time. So you have a stress relaxation time. And those times go up to about a day here, um, 10 to the fifth seconds um, at equilibrium, cover a total of about 14 orders of magnitude. Um, so there's a range of different methods that can be used to measure the slowdown and uh, different materials and maybe I will write this down, different interactions between the molecules or the atoms I'm going to say something about that it's crystallization Okay, so different interactions. We have Van der Waals interactions for, well, this is presumably purely Van der Waals. Dipole-dipole uh, interactions here. This molecule has a big dipole. Hydrogen bonding here. And then, of course, metallic bonding. Uh, for the case in the in the lower right. Okay, let me just see what other points do I want to make here. Um, right. So sometimes we have to worry about experimental systems uh, crystallizing, just like you have to worry about that in simulations. So it's exactly what uh, Patrick said. If there's no gap in the data, okay, then there wasn't a problem in the experiment. And so this was a region for the metallic glass where um, the nucleation and growth of crystals is just too rapid to allow a fair characterization of the liquid. It's maybe worth saying just a, a bit about how the other systems manage to avoid crystallization. So this polymer here is um, it's called an atactic polymer. That means it has random stereochemistry. 
along the backbone, which means that it's basically impossible to imagine how it would fit into a crystal. Okay, so sometimes you can, or another way to think about this is this is an extremely complex mixture. Okay, many, many different components that have different stereochemistry. Um, okay. Ah, so, Gilles mentioned this. Of course, there's endless interest in uh, the functional form that describes how these things slow down. And uh, a standard uh, equation is the vogel tamman fulcher equation that Gilles introduced. mistake in my notes. I should probably fix it. Um, and uh, of course, an interesting point of this equation is that at least by extrapolation, it predicts a divergence in the relaxation time at a finite time. Uh, so um, my understanding is this is the only data set that I show here that actually fits the VTF across the entire temperature range where it's been tested. Okay, and actually that's what these residuals here are showing, that the VTF is a better, a better description of the data than something else. Um, for, tris for a lot of these systems, uh, of course, if you're willing to restrict the temperature range to the, uh, that you look at the equilibrium supercooled liquid to this regime. You can always find a regime where it would fit um, a VTF. There's been a lot of arguments about whether there are other functional forms that don't have divergences that can fit the data equally well. I think the answer is probably yes. Okay. So um, I think this is not a particularly fruitful question to ask, exactly what functional form fits the data. Just my opinion. So all of these do show a super Arrhenius temperature dependence. Some of them are plotted versus inverse temperature, so it's more obvious than others, but it's present in all of these. And then another thought that I had in looking at this, um, which was um, if I had a standard simulation, not one of Ludovic's super simulations, and I could only uh, simulate, you know, to 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 5 seconds, would I be able to make any reasonable prediction about what was going to be able to happen below that? And I would say the answer would be no. So there's a challenge for simulations. Um, so I wanted to give, I wanted to come back to this crystallization for just a moment and uh, tell you a story, perhaps an amusing one. I have this sample of orthotrophenyl. It's in my office. It's in a vial. I didn't bring it with me, but it's just in a test tube. It's sealed. Um, it's been a liquid for 20 years. Okay. Um, this room temperature is 30 degrees below the melting point of orthotrophenyl. Okay. So here's sort of a dumb calculation you can do about how many chances this system had to crystallize. Okay. So I'm at 30, just to specify the experiment. I'm at uh, 30 Kelvin below TM. The alpha relaxation time, structural relaxation time of the system is on the order of one nanosecond. The sample in my test tube has on the order of um, 10 to the 21st molecules. And um, my experiment is 20 years which is about 10 to the 9 seconds. Okay, so I would do the calculation. I'd say, well, I don't know exactly how many molecules have to be there to form a critical nucleus, but let me just guess 100. So my sample has roughly this many independent different volumes. And if any one of them crystallizes, the crystals will grow within a few seconds to, to fill the entire system, okay? 
So this is how many independent volumes I have in my sample. I have 10 to the 9 seconds. It takes about 10 to the minus 9 seconds in order to have a new try to find, to find the right structure to crystallize. So if you multiply these out, that sample's had on the order of 10 to the 37 chances to crystallize. Well, let's say to nucleate. That would be a more precise statement. And it, well, now I'm going to be really disappointed if I go home and find that it's crystalline. But um, so these organic systems uh, have remarkable stability against crystallization, or they can, mm -hmm. even though they're single component systems. That was the point I wanted to make. Yes. Ah, so we're going to let's say. It's a characteristic time for the system to relax, the structural relaxation time. We're going to define this more carefully in the next plot. Okay. Well, you have to make you have to make some estimate of what a critical nucleus size is, and so maybe it's ten, maybe it's a thousand, but it's not really going to change my calculation much. Yes. Oh yeah, and they would grow. Uh, probably a centimeter per second at this temperature. Yeah. So, so once it nucleates, you know, you better be watching or you're going to miss it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, I've spent way too much time on this plot. Uh, but I just wanted to introduce the variety of systems and interactions. Yes, Ludovic. It's, it's tricky. So how do you measure the viscosity of something that's very viscous? So, um, well, you basically you have to find some way to make sure that you're not just what measuring an elastic response because at short times the material will respond elastically. So there's a, a beam bending method uh, which people have used. You actually make a beam out of your sample. You support it at the two ends. You hang a weight in the middle. You make very fine measurements of the height of the middle of the sample and you you know initially there's a fast drop and then eventually you get into a steady so this is I mean the, the way Plazic did the measurements was in a, a torsional creep with a, a rheometer uh, well okay so can let's take the glass measurements off the table for a moment because those are more complicated but in the equilibrium supercooled liquid he has good arguments that those are true are you sure? Um, I, I think that's a hard question to ask. Answer. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next slide. Thank you for asking some questions. Okay. So Gilles introduced this uh, fragile strong. Let's see if I can get the order correct here. This one comes down. So fragile strong, to decide whether something's fragile or strong, you make this plot. You plot log of viscosity or log of a relaxation time. You plot inverse temperature normalized to Tg. Uh, and you find that pretty much any system that's been studied you know, follows somewhere in between SiO2, which is an Arrhenius temperature dependence here, and um, orthodrophenol is giving you a feeling for how curved this behavior can be, but there are actually systems that are considerably more extreme that come down even faster and bend down um, even more. Okay? And the... Uh, so, I guess there's two things I wanted to tell you about this. Um, one is, uh, what it, maybe, maybe the most important thing is what do these terms mean? Um, so I remember when I was learning this field, I thought fragile or strong had to do with what happened when you dropped the thing on the ground, whether it would break or not. Okay, so that's not true. Um, so a strong liquid is one whose structure is resistant to changes in temperature. 
in such a way that when we change the temperature, we get an activation energy which is the same as the one that we had. Okay? A fragile liquid is one in which the structure apparently changes a lot with temperature, such that the apparent activation energy changes. So it is fragile with respect to the perturbation caused by a change in temperature. Okay, so fragility gets quantified in a lot of different ways, and I think this, these are going to show up in some of the later plots. And so uh, I'm just going to introduce one of these, which is a popular one, which is the fragility, kinetic fragility that's given the symbol M, and it's So what that means is basically, in this kind of plot, it's the slope of this line um, here at this axis. And so um, SiO2, the slope is um, about 16, and that's about the smallest number that you'll ever get. Um, the orthotrophenol that's shown there is like 80 or 90. So it's like five times steeper. And then there are systems, uh, the highest ones that I'm thinking about right now, highest M values that I've seen for organic liquids would be on the order of maybe 180 or something like that. Okay, so uh, this is the most supererenous. This is the least. Okay. So there was that great question about what's a alpha relaxation time. So I think it's time to get to, into more detail about exactly what are these times um, that we're measuring. So here when you're defining uh, M, uh -huh. is that the derivative when you are approaching from the left? Or? It is the derivative when you're approaching in the, in, in the equilibrium state. So. Um, this comes down to the definition of TG, uh, which I'm going to come back to later. So just, just trust me and say that you just need to evaluate this in equilibrium. Okay? Because, like, for example, there's that kink along the glass line. You don't want to evaluate it along the glass line out of equilibrium. Yes? Yeah. That is a glass, just to be clear. Well, that is a glass. It's fused silica. I'm sorry if that was unclear. Uh, so, then if we so this is so. S, good point. SiO2 can be a crystal. SiO2 can be not a glass. Sorry, it's a super cool liquid. Okay. I'm, now I perhaps confused you. So all these are super cool liquids. Does that answer your question? Okay. Sorry. Uh, so I would say that there's I don't want to that there's a physical limit where M really can't be less than 16 if you use reasonable arguments. Um, and no, I'm sorry, I didn't make this clear. This is the strong limit. Thank you. And this would be the fragile, something like the fragile limit. All right, so, right, to the next slide. It's the sl the, so for that definition, it's all about the slope at the right as TG is being approached, okay? Um, you know, I, I went over this too quickly. People would also put the viscosity in here and, and define the fragility that way. So you could, you know, which is exactly related to my next point. Which of all these different methods and all these different times are you going to pick to characterize your system? Um, and so the good news is that 
uh, to a first approximation, relaxation times that we measure from different techniques on the same material uh, usually show good agreement. Okay? So it's not going to be such an important point whether we pick the viscosity here or some relaxation time measured by a dielectric experiment. Okay? So, um, you could say what I'm presenting right now is a, it's not true, it's sort of an idealization, but it's the, maybe a good starting material, uh, point for thinking about these materials, is that as you cool down uh, a supercooled liquid, there's a single time scale that's slowing down, and basically many, many different observables are telling you the same thing because there's one thing that's slowing down. Okay, so I'm going to qualify this as we go on, but this, this really is, I think, a good starting point. Okay, so um, let me show you, let me talk about the plot on the left here. So this is um, uh, data for orthotrophenyl. So I'm not going to show you the structure of every molecule, partly because it would be uh, probably expose my inability to remember them all. But orthotrophenyl is one of my favorite molecules, so I'll show you its structure. Um, and uh, it's also one of the best studied supercooled liquids, so this is a good case. So this is a plot which combines data for many, many different techniques, okay, for the same material. Um, and uh, we're going to focus on this, this part that's called the alpha process. That's the, the slow relaxation process, the structural relaxation process. Um, and we'll come back tomorrow and talk about the beta relaxation process. But let's just focus on this branch here. Um, Orthotrophenol is quite a fragile system. It's quite super arrhenius. So let me just briefly describe um, the different observables that are plotted here. Uh, so dielectric relaxation uh, is a very uh, common way to characterize organic materials. Um, and basically what happens in a, uh, a dielectric relaxation measurement it's a, a collective measurement of dipole reorientation. Okay, so uh, the dipole, orthotrophenol is almost nonpolar, so its dipole moment is almost zero, but it will have a dipole. And um, by symmetry, it's guaranteed to be along that, that axis. And um, so the time that you're seeing here can be interpreted as a characteristic time for um, individual orthotrophenol molecules to reorient. That's really what the experiment's measuring, okay? Because it's watching these dipoles uh, fluctuate or actually respond to a teeny tiny electric field that you're putting uh, across the sample. So this is a collective or observable. So I'm just going to give you some sense. So to actually calculate this correctly, I believe what you have to do is you have to sum over, you take your system, like in a simulation, you sum over all the dipoles in the system um, at some time. Okay. And so that's now a vector, okay, sum of vectors. You sum over, you do that calculation at another time, you correlate those two, and what you're really doing here is you're averaging over starting times. Okay. So in order to calculate uh, this observable, if I tell you how one dipole is moving, in principle, you can't calculate this observable because it's this collective thing. Um, and a lot of the observables that we have have this character. Okay, we also have uh, single particle observables, which are different. So I'm going to use um, 
NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, as an example. And um, that's one of the sets of points that's plotted there. I don't remember which one it is. It doesn't matter because they all pretty much agree. And so in an NMR experiment, the way the experiment was actually done is they used per deuterated orthotrophenyl. So everywhere, there's a deuterium. And what the experiment measures is the reorientation characteristics uh, of a vector uh, that is, um, connects a carbon and a deuterium. Okay? And you can write this correlation function as um, roughly the average of the second Legendre polynomial of, let's see, let me call that little vector y. y of t dotted into y of 0. Let me get the right number of parentheses here. Okay. And now, this is a detailed point, but it's the point I'm trying to make, is that now you need to, of course, average over starting times, but you also get to average over all the molecules. Because you really calculate this observable one particle at a time. Okay? And you don't have to know what the entire system is doing. You only have to know what that one thing is doing. Um, so the good news is, is this, in practice, this distinction isn't super important because the times are lining up together. Um, so um, that's an example. So I could, I could explain what some of the other methods are. Um, I think in, because of time, I'm going to skip them. Uh, but just to give you a sense of, of some of the different observables. Uh, on the right-hand side is a beautiful comparison from Sid Nagel's lab. Um, where we compare, for four different liquids, we compare two different ways of measuring the relaxation time. And uh, so one of them is dielectric relaxation, which I already explained. So that's looking at dipole motion. Uh, and the other one is something called heat capacity spectroscopy. Um, and so the, uh, the basic idea with the uh, heat capacity spectroscopy is the, uh, the input, what you put into the system is a um, sinusoidal power input. So What you measure is the, um, for that power, how much the temperature goes up and down. And so this is like a heat capacity and that you know how much energy you put into your system, you know how much the temperature changed, except now you're doing it at a very particular frequency. And so you can define a frequency dependent heat capacity. Okay, and you can then analyze the data in the same way that you analyze the frequency-dependent dielectric response. And you can do a very direct comparison between these observables. And so what's plotted here, the solid symbols are the heat capacity spectroscopy, uh, which are just in beautiful agreement with the dielectric relaxation. Okay, so you know, why, why do these two different kinds of fluctuations that are happening in our system happening at exactly or almost exactly the same time scale. Uh, well, that comes back. So we have, so to a first approximation, you know, the molecular motion in the system is controlling what all of these observables are telling us. Yes. Are these all orientation methods? Well, uh, the, uh, um, actually don't, so viscous flow, I'd say, would not be, strictly speaking, so that's not on this plot, but the viscosity, temperature dependence of the viscosity would agree within this curve to within a factor of two over those 11 orders of magnitude. I mean, so the difference between 11 and 11.3 decades, so basically it's perfect. So 
the particular examples <laughs> that I picked out are focusing on reorientation, but certainly that's, that's not limited to that. Yeah, I am going to tell you about one important exception in a few slides, but this is a good starting point. Yes. So, yeah, I've been a little sloppy about that. Okay, so time scale is, you know, um, you, uh, so uh, you can do these experiments in lots of different ways, but uh, uh, commonly they're done with sinusoidal uh, excitations, and so you really, it's a frequency controlled experiment. So you sweep the frequency, you find the frequency at which you get the maximum response, and then you multiply that times 2 pi, and then you call it a time. So that's really how you interconvert those two different plots. Uh, that's like, is there a correspondence? Like if I take the, from, you know, if I take the span on the left? Ah, could, yes. So, okay, so uh, if they had studied pure orthotrophenyl, which they did not, then I could have taken the results on the left, and I could have predicted the results on the right. And in fact, the dielectric data, there's dielectric data here, there's dielectric data there. And so it's really the same data for the dielectric that's being used for both plots. So hopefully that... I'm just saying for the same material, for the same glass, these two measurements are consistent with each other. The measurement based on the viscosity versus finite frequency response. Okay, well, okay, so just to be clear, I haven't shown the viscosity data, so now I'm just telling you that for many, many organic systems, the temperature dependence of the viscosity matches the temperature dependence of this process, this alpha process, to a very good approximation. Yeah, but it's not shown here. The other question is, uh, so, I mean, how do you get a, how do you get a peak? Because often you just, if you have that single time scale, some exponential relaxation, in frequency space, you get a peak of zero frequency with a wind telling you not to do yeah, okay, so the, the peak is going to appear in the loss component of these experiments, and so um, maybe I just go back quickly. Okay, so this is actually the dielectric loss. It's the frequency at which you're most effectively dissipating energy, and that happens when you're matching the characteristic native reorientation time of the material. Uh, so, so this peak, which happens at 10 to the minus, 10 to the 1 hertz, okay, I would multiply by 2 pi, invert it, and I would give you a characteristic time. Okay? So, you know, I haven't emphasized this point, but like these experiments, uh, all of these experiments are carefully controlled to try and be in a linear response regime. Okay? And I imagine the ones in that corner too are also, I just don't know the details. Okay, let's see. Uh, yeah, so this business about different observables and the single relaxation time. So I want to tell you about an interesting simulation paper. I'm sure some people in the room are going to roll their eyes at this point. Journal Physical Chemistry B, uh, 2013. So these folks, so, so they don't do simulations with spheres of different sizes, you know. They, they simulated, you know, 18 particles <laughs> to mimic orthotrophenyl, you know, hooked together to be as realistic a representation as you can get in a classical force field, okay? And then they used some specially built processors. This is from D.E. Shaw. So they ran simulations out to a millisecond. Okay, I think this is a beautiful paper, um, but the thing that makes it relevant here is that they calculate like seven different observables, okay, and they really try to do a fair calculation of all these different things and compare them in detail. And so if you're interested in exactly why one observable is a little bit different than another one, so I refer you to this paper because I thought it was a very nice, uh, very nice treatment. Okay, so having just said that um, to a first approximation, no matter what you measure, it all slows down the same. 
And now I'm going to tell you the most important exception. That's the next slide. And that's the translational diffusion coefficient. Okay? And so... And uh, so let me explain uh, what's plotted here. Uh, this is trisnaphthal benzene. This is the temperature axis. The right-hand side is the viscosity, actually corrected by the temperature. It's, that's, you can ignore that temperature. It wouldn't change things significantly. And that's the solid line, okay? So the solid line is the standard answer. That's what we get from dielectric relaxation, from NMR, from many, many different techniques. This is the answer we get from translational diffusion. It's a little bit different, and you might say, it doesn't look that different, but uh, I'm going to emphasize two points. One is, this is more than a factor of 100, okay? You line them up at high temperatures, and translational diffusion at low temperatures is now apparently 100 times too fast, so that seems pretty big to me. And the other thing is we spent about a, I spent about a decade of my life trying to get this data, okay? So, so that factor of 100 is important. Um, okay, so maybe just briefly ab about the measurement. So in the high temperature regime, uh, there's a method called pulse field gradient, NMR. Um, and uh, it's a very cool technique. Normally in NMR, you try very, very hard to make your field completely homogeneous because then you get really narrow lines. In this method, you deliberately make your field inhomogeneous so that when molecules translate from here to here, they have different resonance frequencies. And then you use the change in the resonance frequency that occurs in some time to figure out how far they diffused. So the high temperature data here is all from this NMR method. The low temperature data, uh, and that's from Selescu's lab. The low temperature data is from my lab. And this is a very conventional, in some ways, a very conventional diffusion measurement. You have a substrate. You have two layers. You have, they're both um, trisnaphthal benzene. One of them is the standard stuff. One of them is a deuteriate, partially deuteriated version of the stuff. So that's a chemical, that isotope substitution we think is so small it has no impact on the results. So you make a sample in which these things are, say, 50 nanometers layers, and you have a sharp interface between the two, and you just heat it up to some temperature for some period of time. You cool it back down, and then you use a technique that can profile composition. So you can just work out how this interface blurs over time. You fit it to a one-dimensional diffusion equation, and out comes D. And so the smallest D that we measure here is like 10 to the minus 18 centimeters per second. So I just want you to understand that means it took 1,000 seconds on average for a molecule to move one diameter. So, very slow motion. Um, okay, so... Sorry, what is that you're using here? You're using NMR? Uh, ah, so I, I didn't really explain. We're, we're using a technique called SIM, secondary ion mass spectrometry. So you actually drill into the sample with a focused beam of ions. You blow the molecules to smithereens, and you count the protons and deuterons that fly off. Um, okay, so this measurement, I think, has a cool interpretation, so I just want to spend a minute on this. 
Um, so from the data here, we see if we look at this product, the product of the translational diffusion coefficient and the structural relaxation time, which is basically the curve, it's 100 times bigger at low temperature than it is at high temperature. Okay? That's just what the data says. Okay? Um, it's also true, I'm going to plot something slightly different here. I'll explain in a minute. Um, so now I switch tau's on you. This is a molecular reorientation time. Which is basically tracks tau alpha perfectly that you would measure from dielectric relaxation. Okay, and so so if you think about the diffusion equation in, say, in three dimensions, R squared is 6dt, okay? So what I'm going to use, I'm going to use this product d tau and turn it into a mean squared displacement, okay? So this is going to be mean squared displacement in a time tau c at low temperature divided by mean squared displacement in a time tau c at high temperature. Or basically, how far is the molecule going in the time it takes it to rotate? Okay. Now, um, in order to do this, I made an important assumption. Uh, I assumed that, uh, actually, yeah, I assumed that the material, that the liquid is homogeneous. So I can use a, uh, and, and that I can use a, a diffusion equation down to the smallest length scales. Um, but there would be ways of constructing this argument in, in such a way that that's not true, that's, that limitation isn't important. So basically, if you, if you insisted on a homogeneous view of the material, this experiment would tell you that molecules are translating further and further in the time it takes them to reorient at low temperatures than at high temperatures, which just doesn't make any sense to me, okay? And I don't think it's true, okay? And so the basic problem is, is that it's a homogeneous view, a homogeneous interpretation that forces you into that conclusion. And one of the things we're gonna talk about is how dynamics in supercooled liquids are actually quite heterogeneous. And that's what rescues you from this, I mean, this statement is still true on average. It just doesn't have to be true for any individual molecule, okay? So I would say this is another, I mean, I perhaps have missed it, but I would say I haven't seen a computer simulation that could uh, show me that that number of 100, I'm looking at Ludovic, um, is, is present. Probably you would need something that has orientational degrees of freedom. Yeah. Okay, anyway, so this another interesting point of a contact between experiment and simulation. Okay. Um, all right, we need to keep moving. So my goal for today is to say a little bit about dynamics, and we already did that, and then to talk a little bit about thermodynamics and a little bit about structure, and then we'll be done for the day, okay? So let's switch to thermodynamics. Um, okay, so I imagine a plot like this looks familiar, but let me just go over it in case it doesn't. This is for this molecule, trisnaphthal benzene. I've, I've shown its structure. Um, this is real experimental data. Uh, the black lines are stable states. The true, the liquid, the supercooled liquid. Uh, what is it a plot of? It's a plot of molar volume versus temperature. Okay. The experiments are done at constant pressure, one atmosphere. Um, blue is metastable equilibrium. Gilles explained that very well, what that means. Um, so for this particular sample, 
you can sit here for days, weeks, months, and you'll measure the same molar volume. In that sense, the sample is at equilibrium. It's possible that the next day it will crystallize. Okay. And then also shown here, um, unstable states or non-equilibrium states in red are two glasses that have been measured for trisnaphthal benzene. Okay. The one on top was prepared by cooling at uh, one Kelvin per minute. So you all know this, as we go down the supercooled liquid line, things get slower and slower. At some point, the system can't equilibrate anymore, and it gets stuck in a non-equilibrium configuration, which has too much volume in this case. Right? And so, and of course, if, if you give the system more time, then you can get lower than that. They're non-equilibrium states. What you measure out here is going to depend upon every detail of the preparation of the system. So this lower line here was measured. Um, so they took a glass like this. They went down to about here. They waited four days, and it aged, and it got a little bit more dense. Okay? And then they lowered the temperature and brought it back up and measured the molar volume of that glass. Okay? So... True equilibrium states in black, metastable states in blue, non-equilibrium states in red. Okay. Um, two different ways of preparing the glass. Top one, maybe I should write it down. Top red line. cooled at one Kelvin per minute. Bottom red line um, exactly that plus four days aging at Tg minus 10 Kelvin. Okay, hope that's clear. Yes. Oh, yeah. All right. if, if you were to, instead of cooling at one Kelvin per minute, uh, cool 100 times slower than that, you'd probably pretty much hit that lower red line. Um, that's not to say that the glasses are going to be identical, though, but they will have the same molar volume if you hit the right cooling rate. Yeah. Okay. What about... Yeah, so the... Uh, so I cheated a little. I took the actual data from the paper, and, and, and it didn't have all, all the history. But, but if you did an experiment where you cool and then immediately reheat, you would see there would be hysteresis right here. Okay? And I, it just didn't show that part. Yeah? What is Tg, and how precisely is it defined here? When you say Tg minus 10, what is the Tg minus 10? Yeah, well, let's say it's right here. Okay. You're, you're getting... It's at the bottom of the page, definitions of TG, okay? So actually, let me maybe just jump to that. So I've been telling you, do this at TG, do this at TG, but of course, if you cool at different rates, you measure a different TG. And so what does all that really mean? So there's sort of a convention in the field that if you say TG and you don't say anything else, you mean one of two things. So I'll write them down. So one is you cool the system at 10 Kelvin per minute. Okay, So you measure something like this blue line, and then it rolls over to this red line, and we form the intersection between those two lines, and we call that Tg. Okay. Uh, the other is it's the go to the temperature where the alpha relaxation time is 100 seconds in equilibrium. <coughs> uh, 
And for different reasons, you might have a reason. I mean, so these two, for many organic systems, these two agree quite closely. And so it really, I would say for, the, for our purposes here, it doesn't matter. Okay, but just to be specific, uh, this would be, so when I say TG, um, you know, I'm using one of these definitions to say that. Okay? Yes? I could, but it's not on this plot, so it would be pointless. <laughs> yes, so I can show you some data on another slide, probably on uh, lecture three, that will have that hysteresis all in it. Okay? Um, okay, let's see. A couple more details about this plot. Um, uh, Okay, I guess I would make the point that more complex scenarios are possible. For example, we could have a system in which the supercooled liquid makes a first order transition into a liquid crystal state. And then we have a supercooled liquid crystal and it falls out of equilibrium, and then we have a glass of a liquid crystal. Okay? So that's a great thing, because it's got glass, liquid, and crystal, all in the same phrase. So you could go from supercooled liquid to liquid crystal to, I'm going to resist writing glassy liquid crystal glass of liquid crystal. Okay. Um, you could have a system which is polyamorphic. Okay. So, uh, a system that's a, that has a liquid crystal <coughs> can have two liquid phases. There can be a first order phase transition between them. There are just a few systems for which the evidence is quite strong that you can have a first, a first order phase transition between two isotropic liquids, okay? Uh, water is thought to be such a system, although there the evidence is very complicated because it crystallizes so rapidly. Um, but uh, triphenylphosphite, uh, mannitol are systems. And so, in principle, so for example, for mannitol, there's a, actually a jump in the volume when you go to the lower temperature phase and then you form a glass. Okay, so things can be more complicated, uh, but this is certainly a standard scenario. And so I want to leave this slide uh, with one, with a question. That is, so clearly I can make glasses of different densities. Let's suppose I was interested in the ultimate properties of materials. I could ask, what's the highest density glass I could make? Okay, so then you'd say, well, you ought to go back over here, and you ought to cool really, 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 really slowly. And then you'll stay on this line uh, uh, until when? <laughs> so, so there's a sort of a question mark here, which is, you know, and th this plot gives you no insight at all into the question of what's the, the most dense glass that you could make. But the next plot tells us something more important about the limiting properties. Okay, so we've heard a lot about the entropy crisis. Let's see, I need to work over here. So I think it's useful to look at some experimental data. Okay, so my friend Arthur Trefennel, the entropy's plotted on the left side there. Um, and 
So I use the same color coding here. Black states are equilibrium states. Blue states are metastable states. Um, let me just remind you um, where data like this comes from. So you measure heat capacities using calorimetry. Okay, so we know constant pressure heat capacities. Um, we can measure the enthalpy of the first order phase transition with calorimetry. Okay, you remember for the phase transition, delta S is delta H over T. So that's where we get that entropy increment. And then for the rest of the thing, we just integrate CP over T. Okay, and so you can think about the construction of this plot as follows. Start with the pure perfect crystal at absolute zero. Entropy is zero. Integrate the measured CP over T. Up, 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 up. Up to the melting point. Add in the delta S associated with the phase transition. Integrate CP over T in the liquid state to get the top part of the black curve. Now turn around and cool the system into the supercooled state down to here. Um, just integrating CP over T, going down in temperature. Uh, the dashed line is just an extrapolation, okay? It's just, actually, I made up that function. It seemed reasonable to me. Uh, if you're brave and you want to continue to calculate an entropy in a non-equilibrium state, which I would usually prefer not to do, then you would continue to integrate CP over T uh, down the red line, okay? So the, the whole argument about the Kauzman entropy crisis has nothing to do with the red line. So you can just forget about that. We don't have to worry about the difficulties in thinking about that entropy. It's all about this intersection here, that if we do some reasonable extrapolation of the supercooled liquid, the entropy goes below that of the crystal, way above T equals zero. And this plot nicely illustrates that. Um, and so one way to think about you know, the answer to this question, what's the highest density glass of T and B, is to say, well, the entropy gives me some sort of a limit on how far I can go down this curve, and then I can go back to the same the previous plot, and I can go to TK, and I could say, well, if I just extrapolate to TK, that would be my estimate. And if I do that estimate, it would tell me that the most dense glass of T and B is about 2.5% more dense than the one that I make by cooling at one Kelvin per minute and it's about 2.5% less dense than the crystal, okay? Just to sort of give you a sense of, of this. Okay, so let's see. I described, yeah. What happens to this argument for fluids for which there is no crystal? Uh, well, then um, I don't know, how to, don't know how to determine TK. Um, okay, so... Let me just make a point that um, what the crisis shown on the left side is a crisis in the excess entropy, okay? That is the difference between, let me just write this down. So the X, and Gilles said this, but this is an important point. So the excess entropy is the difference in entropy between the supercooled liquid and the crystal. What we'd really like to get from an experiment is the configurational entropy, okay? And I think there is no honest, great way to do this, okay? So what's, what people do is they say, well, we think that we could approximate the configurational entropy as the difference between the entropy of the supercooled liquid and the entropy of the glass, okay? And... Um, So anyway, that's what's done. So I wanted to show you a compilation of, now this is drawn as configurational entropy versus temperature for eight different liquids, okay? And this is the, the way that they did the, the construction. They have some clever ways of estimating this. And uh, all right, so let me just get you oriented here. Uh, let me pick one of these curves. This is toluene. Okay, so this is toluene at 300 Kelvin. This is the melting point where I put that line. 
Okay, this is super cooled toluene. That's a region where it crystallized and they had tr trouble getting the data. Here's the toluene heat capacity data. You see there's also a gap up there in the heat capacity that they filled in with the dashed line and they integrated along the interpolated data. Okay, and so the entropy of toluene is dropping as it goes down and then when it kinks over, that's when they hit the glass transition. Okay, so if I were making this plot, I would have just stopped plotting the data at that point. So, so that you would just have um, uh, equilibrium, an estimate of the configurational entropy in the equilibrium state. Um, how can you bring the, oh, in terms of how do you do that calculation? Bring the crystal back to the glass. You heat above the melting point. You re make the supercooled liquid. You cool down into the glass. Ah, you mean how did they how did they get data on both sides? Okay, so uh, my guess is that as you supercool, the experiment works perfectly fine as you come down till here, and then it crystallizes. But to do the calorimetry, you cool really, really slowly. So what they do instead is they go into the supercooled liquid and they cool quickly into the glass. Okay, and they bypass the the nucleation basically. And then they heat into the supercooled liquid from the low temperature side, and then you can get to the equilibrium supercooled liquid at low temperatures. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay, see, I'm going to talk about an, another curve. This is ethyl benzene. It shows similar behavior. So both of these systems, so Gilles was talking about this factor. So both of these systems show a factor of five drop. In the, in the estimated configurational entropy between the melting point and the TG uh, that they were able to, to access. Okay. Uh, do different graphs correspond to different materials here? Uh, right. Eight different liquids are shown there. And uh, their names actually appear in a couple of slides. And so we can... All right. Okay. So... Um, just to return to a conceptual point that Gio made, the configurational entropy, this is one of those sketches that illustrates that as we go down in the potential energy landscape, there are fewer and fewer minima. That's, at least in a qualitative sense, what we're, why the entropy is dropping so precipitously. And so this estimated Kalsman temperature where this would come out and hit this line would be, if this scenario is right, would be the, the estimate of the, uh, the temperature at which you would hit the, at equilibrium, the lowest energy amorphous state that there is. Okay, that would be the end of the line, which is sort of a very, a very cool thing to think about. Uh, but of course, in experiments, You know, we're running into this nasty equilibration problem, just like you run into in a simulation. You know, you're, you're willing to cool at a fraction of a Kelvin per minute, but not much slower than that. And so you can only get data down so far. But of course, the, the, if you wanted to estimate the Kalsman temperature, you would fit a function here, and you would come down to this axis where it hits zero, and you see that you're really not very far away from TK. And so this is actually what I want to show on the next slide. So these are the eight liquids that were in that plot. And um, I want you to just look at this line. This is um, basically when you're at TG, how close are you to the TK that you extrapolate, ex extract by extrapolation? And, uh, you know, in the best case, you're within 10%. For these liquids, in the worst case, you're about 30% off of that. Okay, and so the um, so I happened to notice in that plot that Ludovic talked about for two days that for the system that he showed, this metric would be about 0.35. It's eyeballing it off of the plot. Okay, and so I would say the most 
this, the experimental systems which are showing the most precipitous entropy crisis, which would be these ones down more at 10 or 12 or 14 percent, um, are showing, which are the most fragile systems, are showing somewhat different behavior than those simulation systems. And so I think these simulation algorithms, deeply equilibrated systems, are super exciting. But Ludovic prompted me to address this question about whether the simulation models are good models of experimental liquids. And I would say this is maybe one thing you want to think about. I, mean, I think it would be interesting if there were computer models that could be so deeply equilibrated that would bring us, you know, more in the range of 10 or 15 percent here. I think that would be, you know, maybe there would be some differences in behavior. Maybe that's an important thing to explore. Um, okay. Actually, we're doing okay in terms of time. So, I promised you dynamics, thermodynamics, and structure. So, we spend the last few minutes on structure. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so, Gilles made the point in his lecture that the structural changes associated with this dramatic slowing down of relaxation times are really small. And I agree with that completely. And um, the, uh, but I thought it would just be useful just to show you some data so that you can see for yourself what it looks like in some real systems. Um, so, this is neutron scattering data on uh, propylene glycol um, at four different temperatures uh, and um, so I guess you'd say if there was a strong connection between the structure and the dynamics you might be able to look at those curves and tell me where TG is for this system uh, so I think that would be challenging so for this system uh, TG is about 160 Kelvin this is propylene glycol. And then if you're asking yourself, yeah, but what would it look like if you actually stacked these on top of each other and really compared them closely? Well, then that's what you get in the right-hand side here. Okay, so this is what happens if you zoom in on the region of the major peak in S of Q. And you can see that there are differences. Um, maybe a 10% change in the height over that temperature range. And there are also changes in the height of the second peak. And so uh, what I would claim about this data is that I believe it's a carefully done study. Okay, And so that's why I bring it uh, to your attention. I do not claim to be able to interpret these differences. Okay. But there are small temperature dependent differences. And of course, one thing to keep in mind is many people are doing simulations at constant volume. This is an experiment at constant pressure. And so the density is changing considerably across this temperature range. So you do expect to see some changes in the, in the structure factor just because of the density change. OK, so and this was a neutron scattering experiment. Here, the height of the peak is decreasing with increasing temperature. Oh, d I'm sorry. I, I, you, I, they fooled me. I would have flipped the, the legend. So I think you read it right. So the height of the peak is, the way it's marked, this is low temperature and that's high temperature. Is this universal? No, I know this is not universal. Okay, And the direction in which it shifts is also not universal. Beyond that, I, I won't make any statements about what's generally observed, but I have seen um, many different examples. I mean, I think the important point is the changes are small. Okay, yes. And the second peak is everywhere else, right? The second peak goes 90 to 300. So it's decreasing with increasing temperature. It is decreasing with increasing temperature. That's right. And sharper because there is uh, 
Don't know. Okay, so an important point is that uh, this is a molecule. Molecules have different kinds of atoms. Scattering experiments see different atoms to different extents. So this isn't like a system of spheres in which it's trivial to interpret S of Q. The experimentally measured S of Q is actually a convolution or a sum of a whole bunch of different partial scattering functions that depend upon different types of atoms. And all of these things make it more complicated to interpret in detail. But I think the point that the changes are small is a good one. Um, so I'll just write that down. Changes with temperature are small. Okay, so you can certainly pick systems for which the changes are bigger. But I'm not sure that these changes really have anything to do with the glass transition. So I just picked this example, which was from Fisher's lab. This is now x-ray scattering. Uh, and these are both cases in which there are, are more obvious changes in the shape of the, of the scattering intensity with temperature. Um, but, you know, there, I, I know Salol has, you know, Salol has some interesting features in its dynamics that aren't seen in all systems. And so I think uh, there's no reason to think that these patterns are universal. I would, if, uh, I would be hesitant to, I mean, I'm just saying there are examples where you definitely see bigger changes. I don't know how you interpret them, but I think can you find TG is a, is a I, I would say, I can't look at those and tell you what TG is. And so um, the connection between these changes and dynamics is not, is not at all clear. Okay, so I did want to show one example. Of a system where I think there really is a consistent connection between changes in structure and dynamics. And... Um, there are some in the audience who are more skeptical about this than I am. Okay, so this is a, a series of metallic glasses. It's x-ray scattering. The, uh, uh, there's data on like 15 different systems here. Uh, so all of these systems tend to crystallize in the middle of the supercooled liquid range. Uh, and these experiments, I, I just can't resist telling you a little bit about them. These are experiments that are done on levitated spheres of, of metallic glasses at a synchrotron, okay? And they do this to avoid contact with a container that would lead to heterogeneous nucleation, okay? So the sphere is like suspended there and you do the X-ray experiment right through. This is work from Ken Kelton and collaborators. Okay, so let me see if I can explain the features here. Uh, so they measure S of Q at different temperatures. So for example, this is a vitriloy. This is one of the commercially available metallic glass alloys. And this is what S of Q looks like at 1.9 TG, 1.7 TG, and at TG. And so it's pretty hard to see that there's any change. Okay, but these are synchrotron measurements and the data are very precise. And so what they've done is they've, they've, you could look at many different things. They're just looking at the height of the biggest peak and plotting how the height of that peak behaves as a function of temperature. So for this system, you make some measurements here at high temperature, okay? And then you extrapolate across the range where it crystallizes and you make measurements at low temperatures and they almost line up, okay? And this, the, from, from the dynamics that they can measure, this system is more of a strong glass former, a more Arrhenius temperature dependence, okay? So this is a more fragile glass former and now you do the same construction and things miss. That is the high temperature behavior 
does not allow you to extrapolate to see what you'll have at TG. And of course, this is exactly what's true in the dynamics. For a strong glass former, from the high temperature behavior, you can predict what's going to happen at TG because it's Arrhenius. But for a fragile glass former, if you do some obvious extrapolation, you're going to miss by a lot. And so the plot at the bottom is just correlating these two things. Okay? This thing that's a measure of structure, which is basically how far you're missing by here, and um, an activation energy associated with the viscosity on this axis. Okay, and so there's 10 or 12 systems. There's a reasonable correlation. Maybe when somebody studies another 90 systems, it won't look like a correlation. I don't know, but I thought this was a, uh, a, an interesting attempt to really try to make a connection between changes in structure and the dynamics of the liquid. I would say it's the best example I know of where it seems like there's a good correlation. Okay, and then this worked out perfectly. This is the last slide I wanted to talk about today. So we've talked about dynamics, about thermodynamics, and about structure. Okay, the last slide was trying to make a correlation between structure and dynamics. So this slide is about trying to make a correlation between thermodynamics and dynamics, okay? And um, so there's two different things plotted here. Um, and we'll go through the details. But both of these plots basically have this format. Something on this axis is about the dynamics in the system, um, perhaps the fragility. Something on this axis is a thermodynamic quantity. Okay, so this is just, you know, this is what experimentalists do. When we don't trust theories, we just try and look at the data and see what correlations are present. Okay, so uh, this plot on the right is connecting the fragility M, I defined that earlier, that's related to how non-Arrhenius you are, to an interesting combination of thermodynamic parameters which involve uh, delta H of, uh, for the melting transition um, and the change in the heat capacity measured with calorimetry, appropriately normalized. And, okay, I'd say that looks reasonable. I mean, there's something there. Um, the plot on the left is connecting these two possible divergence temperatures, right? So remember the VTF equation, uh, VTF equation, I guess it got copied. The VTF equation, if the extrapolation is correct, tells you relaxation times become infinite at a time T naught. Uh, the entropy crisis tells you that um, the bottom of the landscape, you're at the end of the line when you get to TK, okay? And so this is a plot just of T naught versus TK. So remember, this is completely determined by dynamics. This is completely determined by the thermodynamics. And I'd say there's a reasonable correlation there. And so... Um, Now, I have to say that I'm sure when you start picking at these plots, there's going to be some fuzzy issues. And one of the fuzzy issues is that the data doesn't really fit a VTF over the entire temperature range. And so in constructing this plot, you had to make a decision about what you're going to fit. And so I, I, I wouldn't claim that this is completely unambiguous. Um, but, I, you know, it looks to me like, you know, just looking at the experimental data, um, it's reasonable to think that there's this um, strong underlying connection between the thermodynamics and, and the, the kinetics. Now, maybe all of you are thinking, well, of course, that's obvious. There must be. But let me just give you a, a counterexample. You know, I'm a chemist. I teach thermodynamics. I teach chemical kinetics. Okay. So can I predict the rate that a chemical reaction occurs at from a knowledge of delta G or delta H for the reaction? The answer is no. Okay, so I'd say it's not at all obvious 
that you should be able to uh, understand the dynamics based on uh, thermodynamic measurements. Is there something special about these open data points? Um, I'm sure there is, and I don't know what it is right offhand. Yes? Is there something a little bit genius about the plot of TK versus T0? Because I mean, both of them depend on the choice of extrapolation, but more importantly, both of them by construction are close to TG. So of course they're going to be slow. I think that's a fair critique. I mean, uh, and one that's been made. Uh, the um, I, I guess I don't know how to tease that out in, in a quantitative way. Um, there are certainly other uh, there are other tests that one can do that don't involve this extrapolation. I think Gilles maybe ma mentioned one in his first lecture. Um, if you assume that there's this connection between I mean, this says there's a, co a connection between the configurational entropy going to zero and the dynamics going to infinity. If you assume that these two quantities are connected and you write down an equation that connects them, like the Adam-Gibbs relation, then you can test that equation in the equilibrium regime and the extrapolation issues are, are taken out. I could also show, uh, perhaps that would have been a better example, but there are also a number of systems that you know, the six or seven decades of relaxation times just above TG seem to be the things that are non Arrhenius in the standard format become a straight line when using the configurational entropy. Uh, so I'd say that's that's a you know one way to get around that uh, concern. But I would agree that's an issue with this plot. Okay. Yes. It does claim that, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't. I haven't looked at it closely enough recently to have. Um, I I wouldn't be able to say. Okay. <laughs> All right. Great.